Hey everybody, James Shepard here, and before we start this week's podcast episode, I want to talk to you about an exciting new technology solution called Valor Paytech. Now, this is a processor agnostic solution, meaning it works with any processor. It's omni-channel, meaning you have gateways and you have electronic invoicing and you have physical terminals as well that all integrate together. But what I think is really cool is that it is built on top of cash discounting and surcharging as kind of some foundational features that are built in. So they handle things like being able to waive the fee. They handle things like tip adjust and still having the cash discount. All of these things have been thought through with cash discounting and surcharging in mind. Now, why am I talking about Valor Paytech? Because... After about six years of never talking about a single company, I am personally and publicly promoting Valor Paytech. I have allowed them to become the official sponsor of this podcast. Now, the reason I've done that is because I believe that cash discounting and surcharging should largely be a technology uh, you know, question or a technology solution as we move forward. I've talked to way too many ISOs, especially larger ISOs, that they have commitments to you know, these different companies that they work with, you know, TSIS or whoever. And what's happening is they're choosing to have to put deals with a certain processor because they want to offer cash discounting or surcharging. And the truth is we're at a point now where there are processor agnostic solutions that will allow you to offer these things in a really convenient way. And so because of that, I have asked Valor Paytech to become the official sponsor of our podcast. So here's what I would ask each of you to do. If you're getting value from this show, from this podcast, I want you to show Valor Paytech how much you appreciate them sponsoring this podcast. It's a personal favor to me. I want to really show them the interest that our community has around cash discounting and surcharging and just great technology in general. Head over to ccsalespro.com slash Valor, V-A-L-O-R, ccsalespro.com slash Valor, V-A-L-O-R. You can schedule a free demo and you can watch some videos there about the technology. So you're going to be hearing a lot about Valor Paytech in the podcast moving forward as they're now our official sponsor. Again, I wouldn't pick a particular processing company. I'm not going to get into all of that because I know we have a lot of listeners from a lot of different processing companies. But when I looked at the technology that Valor Paytech offered, Seemed like a no-brainer to me to promote it on the podcast because I really believe it's going to be valuable to our entire audience as a processor agnostic omni-channel solution. So do me a favor right now, before we jump into the episode, pause the episode right now, whether you're you know, driving, pull over for a second, do me that favor, or if you're watching the video, pause it, go to ccsalespro.com slash Valor, V-A-L-O-R, just fill that little form out right there, and then a representative from Valor is going to reach out to you to schedule a demo, and I promise you, you're going to be blown away when you see how incredible the technology is, and then of course, when you look past that and see, wow, it's got cash discounting and surcharging, either one totally built into the technology solution. So with all that said, let's jump into today's episode. Welcome to the Merchant Sales Podcast. Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining us on the podcast. Today, we have Dave Figley. Dave is the VP of Sales and Business Development at Retriever Merchant Solutions. How are you doing today, Dave? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, thanks for jumping on. Um, so I'm really excited about today's topic. Uh, Dave has had a lot of experience working with individual reps who are successfully selling cash discounting, even during the COVID-19 situation. And so we're going to be talking about cash discounting sales success and what's working in the field with agents. Um, but before we do that, Dave, I know you have a great story. We've known each other for a while. So if you could share with our listeners, how did you end up in this crazy industry? And then how did that end up you know, with Retriever Merchant Solutions? Uh, well, back in 2005, I was running an insurance agent agency, um, and uh, I had just married my wife, and my wife was working for a gentleman who had a, uh, a small ISO startup. He had about 25 or 30 agents working for him, and uh, I went in for lunch to uh, take her to lunch one day and met Brian Camstra, who's the president of Retriever. And uh, he kind of recruited me in as a sales agent and I uh, came in <laughs> as an independent agent, nice. uh, closed up my insurance office. And, um, you know, I was an outside agent for, I'd say, 14 years, 13 years. Um, I still sell outside occasionally. I still sell 30 or 40 deals a year. Um, and uh, about 10 years into my experience, uh, I started building uh, sub-ISO. Uh, 
and uh, started recruiting agents, training agents. And uh, now uh, I kind of, I'm an employee of Retriever Merchant Ser Services as well as uh, still running a uh, ISO or sub ISO of Retriever Merchant Services. Right. So I got into it through my wife. My wife is still in it. She's the uh, operations, um, I guess her title now is the COO of Retriever. And uh, we've grown a lot since then. We've uh, went from doing, I think we were doing maybe 150, 200 deals at that time. When I came into the business, uh, and now we average between 700 and 1,000. So the business has grown quite a bit since I got in it. Yeah, you know, one thing I had, I wasn't going to ask you, but I, I just have to because I talked to a lot of reps that are, you know, coming from insurance or mortgages or whatever. I'm really curious. I don't know if I've ever asked you this. Why did you, like, what was it that Brian told you or that you realized about this industry that made you shut down your insurance office? Great question. I was thinking the very same thing, yeah. James. Like, you had a successful business, and then, like, there must have been, something that really just grabbed you about this business? Honestly, what happened was I started out my sales career selling for a company called Fintop, selling outside door-to-door -door, uh, sales. And the structure of our ISO and what Brian had developed as far as how he had his sales reps training was door-to-door, -door, uh, cold calling um, on merchants, individuals, small business owners, you know, usually one to five location type places. And I had been really successful uh, in a short period of time in that industry. The insurance industry, I had to get my investment licenses and all that stuff. Right. And quite honestly, I was doing okay, but uh, there's a struggle when you're in your 20s going into people's homes and trying to, you know, tell somebody who's 25 years older than you what to do with their money when yeah. you've only been in the real world for five or 10 years. Right. Um, so I was really good at writing property and casualty, which is home and auto and stuff like that. But the life insurance and investment stuff, uh, it was it was kind of a struggle because, you know, it, just the age factor yeah. uh, was an issue. The other thing was, is I'm not one to be cooped up in an office for 10 or 11 hours. Mm -hmm. um, and this allowed me to uh, get out of that environment where I was stuck in an office. Sure. So... That, along with the income potential, was, you know, another thing. The insurance industry is very lucrative. However, it's it's more of a slow build, I guess you'd say. Right. Uh, whereas in this industry, you can make really good money really fast. Sure, sure. So, so. Like that, I think that's a great segue, James, to our next question, which is, you know, a lot of agents have been struggling, you know, particularly this year. It's been a rough year for a lot of folks. Um and I know that, you know, through James and through you, I know that Retriever has some interesting success stories. Um, you know, wondering if you could, uh, you know, perhaps share some of those, particularly as they relate to uh, cash discounting. And, you know, are you still seeing, are, are your agents still able to build the residuals? And is this yeah. the case? Yeah, you know, surprisingly um, enough, through... Uh, this, the period, I guess to call it the COVID period, uh, since the beginning of the year, right. we've actually still seen, uh, although our new business has, has dipped a little bit, we're down about 11 or 12 percent. Um, our, our residual growth has actually been up about 14 percent. So the wow. average agent at Retriever has seen 14 percent growth. And a lot of that is because we, we do 40 percent. 45% in some months cash discounting, which, you know, at Retriever, on average, the cash discounting accounts make four and a half times what a standard new board uh, on traditional credit card processing would make. But as far as success stories, yeah, we've, we've had a lot of agents, um, you know, be able to sell 10, 15, 20 accounts a month right through this period. Uh, they've had to get creative. Um a lot of our agents have gone the way of traveling to states that don't have lockdowns. So uh, they'll yeah. find a neighboring, they'll find a neighboring state and, uh, you know, go travel. They might drive two, three hours a day um, and hmm. drive to that state and sell. Uh, the other thing that a lot of our agents have done is we've provided them with a lot of products and connections to, uh, I guess you'd call them ancillary products uh, to sell things like online ordering, um, 
you know, we do a lot of the mobile sales. Um, in fact, what a lot of our agents have capitalized on is when this whole COVID thing started, what Retriever did is we proactively called all of our merchants, uh, over 30,000 of them, as a matter of fact, and proactively, uh, we removed fees for a couple months for them. We deferred some fees that we couldn't remove. And we offered free gateway and free mobile devices to every one of our merchants. And what that allowed our agents to do is call them after our office had reached out to them uh, and made a good impression. And, and you know, basically told them, hey, we're on your side. You're a small business. We understand what you're going through but it allowed them to call them and get referrals. So a lot of our uh, agents capitalized on the fact that, you know, our, our president and our agents and our processing partners went a third, a third, a third on all of the cost of what we did for these merchants, uh, worked together and proactively, um, you know, went out and helped the, helped the merchant. And when you do that to, for most of these merchants, they appreciate it. So it allowed our reps to give them a call a couple weeks later and ask them for a referral business. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, in today's day and age, I think you can, there's some, uh, you know, merchant empathy and, you know, merchants want to save money more than ever. Right. Uh, and I think they see an opportunity where their customers, um, especially some of these small local businesses, will be more apt to accept a, you know, a service fee or a charge on the credit cards just right. to keep the small business, you know, yeah, afloat. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I like sure. it. I like it. So, so Dave, let's, you know, I want to get really specific with cash discounting. So when okay. you, when you think about, you know, five, six, seven reps, I know five or six or seven retriever reps that would fit this description that are killing it with cash discounting, you know, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40,000 a month in residual type, you know, reps. When you look mm -hmm. back at the last 90 days or so, how are they prospecting? You know, what have you heard from them? Any kind of tips or insights you could share of like, you mentioned already kind of traveling to another state. Are there other things that they're doing to allow them to continue getting new business? Yeah, you know, they're targeting, uh, you know, obviously, like I said, areas that aren't, you know, what we would say are in lockdown. But uh, the other thing they're doing is they're really focusing on some of the businesses that we've had a lot of success with. Uh, in the past, we've always had the, uh, you know, philosophy and we've always taught at Retrievers, the door you walk by is the door you would have wrote. And right. you need to go into every business. Right. Um, you know, we don't have a lot of, we have some, but we don't have a lot of agents or small sub ISOs that focus on one niche group right. or one vertical. Um, this has kind of caused us to go in a little different direction. And a lot of our reps have done that. So sure. what the, the successful ones, the, the number one thing they've done is not let this be a crutch. You know, when you right. give mm -hmm. outside salespeople, people who have a lot of freedom, an excuse not to go to work, Right. a lot of them like to take it. <laughs> uh, but the <laughs> successful people in this industry don't look at it as a crutch or an opportunity not to go to work. They look at where it could be an opportunity to benefit from it. And what they're doing is, you know, they're really, there's no bigger time or better time in my history of doing bank card than now to go out and save merchants money. Uh, merchants are looking to save their businesses right. and save every penny where in the past when things were good, sometimes merchants, you know, money was everything to them. Sometimes right. they didn't want to, you know, upset a, a, a you know, a customer. customer. Yeah. Now with the customers having the ability or having the, you know, the knowledge of what's going on and the hardship that small businesses are having, uh, I think merchants are more apt to accept it. The big thing is, is merchants aren't seeing a lot of salespeople now because right. a lot of sales reps are not going out, not right. selling to the merchants, and they are using it as a crutch. I mean, you know, in the Midwest where I'm at, uh, where a lot of our agents are, you know, it's kind of a weird dynamic because Illinois is locked down for the most part. Indiana is wide open. You can find states that are wide open and right. go work. And our successful agents are doing that. Yeah. 
Yeah. And it's, I, I like what you said because it's the idea of the mindset, right? Like they're not looking at it as, oh, COVID-19, this is a reason for me not to go to work. They're looking at it as it's a challenge. It's an opportunity. How do I, how do I pivot? How do I adjust, right? To, to make it happen still. Yeah. And, and I think there's a, there's a, a real belief and I, I believe it to be true that merchants are more apt to look at a program like cash discounting because they understand that their customers want to keep them in business. Right. A lot of these local businesses right. that have local customers come in, right. give larger tips, try to order food from them. You know, I know I right. have with some of my favorite restaurants and right. places mm-hmm. that I, I have. And I think if you're a smart sales rep, you can take advantage of some of that. Yeah. Help the merchant help themselves. You know what's yeah, and, you, and you, I think also, I mean, you're, to your point about customers, I think, you know, this sort of go small, help, you know, help local has taken on much more of an urgency uh, this year than in the past. And absolutely. Like, like you say, I mean, I find myself, you know, uh, giving bigger tips because I know these, you know, people aren't getting the tips that they used to get. And I'm, right. you know, just... It doesn't hurt me to give an extra, you know, an extra five dollar tip. Well, then it's not going to hurt me to pay a pay a surcharge, for example, or or you know, non cash adjustment. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think it really serves people well to understand that in some way, shape, or form, even outside of this business, we're all in this together. Right. So, you know, if if we help somebody out today, maybe down the line, somebody's going to help us out. Right. And if they don't, you know. I, I'm a big believer in, you know, doing the right thing anyways, and it'll always work out. You, but so yeah. I just think, I think, uh, you know, like in any business or anything you do in life, attitude is everything. And if you get the right attitude, like a lot of our agents do, you do very well. Yeah. Uh, you know, we have some agents that have used it as a crutch and kind of gotten almost totally out of the business just because right. they're using it as an excuse. Right. right. When they could be using it as an opportunity to, you know, have massive uh, growth in their portfolio right now. So, right. so let, you know, Dave, one of the reasons I was really excited to have you on, you know, you and I have known each other for a while and I think we have kind of a similar mindset about cash discounting. Um, you know, you had the experience of actually building your own book of business. And then now of course with a large team and even, you know, working with retriever directly and all that. So, you know, as I talk to a lot of other executives at other processing companies, they still really struggle with the concept. They really do the cash discount, you know, well, number one, is it here to stay? Um, is it still a big opportunity? And then it's funny. I'll talk to some reps that are like on the other extreme. I think it's getting saturated. My market, a lot of people are already doing it. The people who aren't doing it have already heard of it and they don't want to like, if we kind of really zoom out for a minute, how do you feel about cash discounting? Like where are we at as an industry right now with cash discounting and where do you see it going the next 12 to 24 months? I think we're still in the beginning stages of it. I mean, uh, you know, I think most merchants or many merchants have heard of it at least now, right. whereas maybe, you know, 18 months ago they had not. Um, however, I think this is a product that the more prevalent becomes, the easier it's going to become for an agent to sell. Uh, you know, a merchant who didn't want to do it maybe 18 months ago or 12 months ago due to being the, you know, they don't want to be the first one in their small town or the first one in the, on the block doing it. Now two or three people are are doing it. They see that it hasn't hurt their business. I think it becomes easier to sell. I really think we're still in the beginning stages of it. And you can see that by just now we're starting to see some real, uh, you know, integrated solutions to go along with cash discounting. In the beginning, everybody was selling cash discounting. Nobody wanted to put a lot of money into it because they didn't know how long it was going to stay. Right. And they're basically selling it on a, you know, plain, you know, box terminal, what you call it, you call a box terminal that runs on, you know, Ethernet or the phone line. Now you're seeing real integrated solutions. Yeah. And I think even we, we take a lot of, believe it or not, we take a lot of business from existing cash discounting merchants just because they want other solutions. Right. They, they, they actually went backwards in technology and backwards in software in order to save to the money. Save money. Right. Now we can come in and give them the same solution right. and save them the money. Right. So we actually, we actually do about 10 to 15% of our new, Cash discounting business is actually people who are already doing it. Huh. 
And so, so you're saying the pitch there is, hey, you're already doing this program, but wouldn't it be great to have an omni-channel or to have a point of sale system again or yeah. whatever, right? Yeah, no different than, you know, in traditional credit card processing, taking somebody from a terminal to a POS system or to right. some type of It's almost software. like that, that cycle is starting over again with cash discounting. Yep. Huh. Exactly. That's, I hadn't thought about that before. That's actually really interesting. So yeah, I like that. Um, so Dave, uh, one more question kind of specifically about cash discounting here. So, you know, we've talked a lot about kind of the struggles some of the reps go through, of course, you know, and, and real or imagined, right. Um, they go through these struggles. Um, right. and, but there are obstacles, there are kind of roadblocks that a lot of them might be hitting to try to get to that next level. So what I'm curious about is you've been doing this for a long time. Talk to us a little bit more specifically about what you do, about what Retriever does. What are the methods from a management, kind of an executive level or a you know team building level? What are you doing for Retriever reps specifically that you feel like is helping them to continue to grow their book of business and build their residual income? Well, I mean, speaking of cash discounting specifically, the biggest obstacle I have seen personally with the reps that I deal with, the, the, the reps that don't believe in it themselves yeah, and don't agree with it themselves. Right. Generally speaking, have a very hard time with it. So <laughs> what a, what a surprise! <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, I you know, I have a couple agents that when it first came out, they were, I would never pay that fee. I'd argue with the merchant. You know, they had right. that attitude, and they could not sell it. So generally speaking, what we do is, you know, I will actually take that person and stick them in the car or put them in the field with somebody who does it very successfully right or even proactively call a merchant or two with them that is using the program with us and let them explain to them that it's it's more perception not reality that customers right. have a big issue with it and that merchants do so that's the biggest obstacle i see um the biggest like i said the biggest thing we do is we have uh, you know i'm a true believer that really to train somebody in this industry uh, successfully to sell the way, you know, Retriever has always sold, which is, you know, 90% of our business is face to face. I think you have to get out in the field and see it being done. Um, and if you can't see it being done, at least hear it being done. So we'll, we'll do things like, you know, record sales calls and do things like that uh, with, the agent to kind of get them to believe in the product first. Once they believe in the product, I, I it's just a matter of going to work because the product sells itself, especially in cash discounting. Right. And I'm not really, when we get new agents, you know, it, it's almost a, a place where we're having them sell cash discounting first. Sure. Because it's so easy. And they will learn right. standard credit card processing through right. the, you know, I guess yeah. through through the process of uh, you know running into those merchants who say they're totally against cash discounting. All right. I think it's interesting you bring it up. Actually, we've talked about it on the podcast in a few different interviews that you know one of the big advantages in our industry of cash discounting that people don't talk about is actually agent training. You know, it's like people mm -hmm. are like, why are all these ISOs going to cash discounting? It's like, well, the merchants love it. It's more profitable, so that's great. But in addition to that, when you're bringing a new rep in, training them to sell cash discounting versus training them to sell interchange plus pricing, right? I mean, that's a pretty big difference. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's the easiest thing in the world to <laughs> right. sell because you, you don't have to teach them how to, you know, reading a statement right. is very difficult for some agents. You have a great tool. Uh, you know, we use your tool, obviously, to, right. uh, uh, for our agents, but you know, even using the tool, there's always questions in the back right. of the, the they, mind. Just, even if it's accurate, right. they may not know what the stuff is that they're seeing. And so you still have to, tra they still have to yeah. be able to communicate with the merchant versus saying, I'm going to eliminate your fees. I mean, that's just a lot easier. Yeah. So our big thing is trying to focus on teaching, you know, cash discounting is pretty simple as far as pricing, but we're trying to teach them to really ask the merchant, uh, you know, questions to try to help them, you know, find out what, where the merchant's pain points are besides price. I mean, we right. can always say the money, right? but if you go in there every time and all you're doing is price, 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 right? you're just, you're going to sell accounts if you work hard, but right. you really need to ask the merchant the right buying questions and find out what you can do to help them. And then you know, our attrition year over year goes down, down, down because we've taken that philosophy philosophy over the last five or six years that 
you know, we want to train the agents on all the different products we offer so that they can put the merchant in the right position. Yeah. Yeah. You know, last thing I will say about this, because I think it, I think it's worth mentioning is, you know, a trend I've seen is a lot of what are called ISOs, which stands for independent sales organization. They've almost become ISVs in a way where they have these salespeople, which they look at as kind of a necessary evil to push technology out into the marketplace. And so I right. think one of the things that's interesting about Retriever, I know what you do and, and many others in the industry also that are professionals in this, but, you know, that idea of like actually focusing on the sales, you know, having the events and having the, you know, the, the rah, rah, rah and the training and the like focus on, hey, you know, it, it's, it's not just about, well, I've got this gateway and I've got this, you know, point of sale system, but ultimately it's a sales organization and you have to like, if you want to have a sales organization that requires like training salespeople and coaching and sending them out with somebody else. And right. Like, have you seen that kind of like actually focusing on sales and getting some upside from that? Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I still believe that, uh, you know, most people want to buy from people and people want to buy from people they like. I right. mean, it's, you know, give me an agent that has a great attitude that's positive that knows nothing about the business and I'll put him up against the guy who knows everybody, everything about the business. Right. And the person with the positive attitude is going to win every time. I mean, if you look at some of our most successful sales agents, you know, most of them start out and they're just as successful as they are five years later in right. the beginning, right. knowing nothing about the business because right. it's people buy from people they like and people that they, you know, seem to get along with and trust. Trust, right? Yep. Trust. Yep. yep. And that's yeah, and I mean, just salesmanship. I don't know how much truth there is to it, but I was always told, you know, the old, the old adage: people know if they're going to buy from you in the first sixty seconds. I I kind of believe in that because there's just I've seen so many agents come through our office that have every skill in the world except for a smile on their face, right? And a good attitude. Yeah, I think and I think merchants. I think merchants definitely know if they're not going to buy from you in the first sixty seconds. Like, yeah, I like that better. you know what I mean? Like <laughs> you, you, you're going to, you can eliminate a lot of them. Now when it gets down to it, there's other variables, but it's like most of the sales reps I go to, honestly, like if I'm out in the field with a rep, 19 out of 20 people they talk to or, or 99 out of a hundred, a lot of times it's like, no, the, the first 15, 20 seconds you were dead. <laughs> You never had a chance because, and again, yeah. because they, they don't have that positive attitude. They don't have that enthusiasm, that confidence. And it's like, that's called sales ability, sales skill. It's like, it's a thing. It's like, you have to learn how to do it. And once you do it, it pays actually really, really well, especially in the context of cash discounting, you know? Yeah. I mean, one of the things, one of the things I always tell people, and it took me a while to learn this and become efficient, but I think the biggest thing you can learn, especially in door-to-door -door sales is don't try to sell everybody just go find the buyer it's easier to knock on 30 doors and find a buyer yep. than it is to try to cram something down somebody's throat i mean if the person's yep. not interested get out of there and move on to the next person and a lot of these agents they just they don't get this the concept they, they they're so they hate walking into businesses so much right and they think once they walk in and actually find an owner, they have to try to sell that owner. Right. Or it's the last chance they're going to have. Yeah. Whereas if you look at it as there's 40 other business owners I can see today. Right. I'm just going to go find the one that's either having an issue or wants to buy. It's a lot easier. Yeah, I love that. that. I love that. Yeah, it's good because what happens is they, they get their expectation too high and then they get burned out so fast. Like they'll go to five or six businesses and they get rejected at all five or six and they mm -hmm. get rejected hard because they're really trying to sell the person that has no interest. And then they're like, man, this day sucks. I'm going home to watch Netflix instead of like, well, you know, I'm just like you said, I love that. Just looking for a buyer. So, all right, well, Dave, we could go on talking like this for a long time. So let's, let's do this though. Before we go, I know a lot of our listeners, uh, you know, would want to learn more about you, your team, uh, retriever, et cetera. So where would you send them to, to learn more about joining the retriever family? You know, they can obviously go to, um, our website, which is www.rmsnpc.com and look at that stuff. But if they really want to talk about our business, they can give me a call at, you know, 219-677-2110. If they want to send me a text message uh, and just say they saw me on the podcast or heard me on the podcast and uh, set up a call, they can email me. Um, my email address is D-F-I-E-G-L-E at rmsnpc.com. Uh, or they can simply call our office and uh, ask for me and they'll get me in 
you know, gets you in touch with me and it's our office number 708-225-2900. Um, we're, a, we're a, a fairly large organization, but we're really accessible. We don't have a lot of red tape. We have the president, we have the CFO, my wife, myself, and a couple other sales, uh, you know, small sales offices, but we're, you know, we're very accessible and we'd be happy to talk to anybody. You know, if they just want to ask us some questions and find out what we're doing. Awesome. Dave, thank you so much for your time today, man. Really appreciate you uh, being on the podcast. Yeah. Really hey, thanks for having me, Patty. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Take care. Great talking to you. Hey, everybody. Patty and I wanted to take two minutes and give you a feature of Valor Paytech. We both saw the demo for it yesterday, Patty, right? It was way cool, James. I have to say, you know, I've been I've been watching demos for years and I was I was wowed by this one. Um, yeah. yeah, it's awesome. So we're super excited to have them as our sponsor on the podcast. Today, we want to talk to you about the Wave the Fee feature. Never seen it exactly like this. So no, right. The way Valor sets it up is you know, first of all, the merchant can waive this fee. So on, on cash discounting or surcharging, they can just mm -hmm. waive the fee and you can actually set it up one of two different ways. Either when they waive the fee, they can absorb the cost. So if it's like a 3.99% fee, right. the merchant pays the 3.99. If it's a larger business and they're like, well, I don't want to pay 399, you can actually set up two different mids. Right. Right. And one is traditional, like interchange plus, and the other is cash discount or surcharge. And when they click waive the fee, it actually what is it called? Intelligent routing and intelligent it routing, it right? To the to the alternate one. So that was that was a pretty cool feature, Patty. I thought that was really cool because I, you know, my thought is that can become really complicated, especially for larger enterprises. Right. You know, how do you deal with these varying type of customers? Yeah. Uh, you know, there may be some where you know you just want to waive the fee, but a lot of times it's with large purchases, um, you know, there needs to be there needs to be an alternative. Absolutely. And the fact yeah. that this is just click that button yep and everything's out i love I, finally, I just thought that was really cool finally eliminate the only objection that matters with cash discounting right so uh right yeah so if you're looking for a processor agnostic technology solution that's got omni channel gateway terminal all the stuff in the bells and whistles but has built on cash discounting and surcharging check out ccsalespro.com slash valor v-a-l-o-r where you can request a free demo ccsalespro.com slash valor and now, here is Questions from the Field with James Shepard. So, Patty, I thought with our you know episode today, we have Valor Paytech, you know, as our sponsor now. We were talking right. to Dave Figley about uh, you know, cash discounting. And so I'm like, you know, let's keep with the theme. So my questions from the field today, I want to talk about why cash discounting is right for the consumer. Now, I've talked about this. I probably had a similar conversation several times on the podcast, but I really wanted to kind of isolate this point and make it because um, I get this question so much from salespeople, and it's mm -hmm. an implied question, as Dave mentioned on, on the interview, right? The question usually is something like, I'm having a hard time selling cash discounting. Why? And I don't even need to ask any other questions anymore. Mm -hmm. You know how to sell, and you're working hard, and you're not selling cash discounting. The only reason is you don't really believe in it. Right. Right. Just That's like it. Dave said, if you don't believe in it, you can't sell it. Right. So something I came up with this week, I was actually doing a, a live event. It was a virtual event, of course, uh, with a very large processing company. And I was like kind of their guest speaker of the of, on the Zoom call or whatever. And I came up with something on that call. And I was like, oh, I can't wait to share that on the podcast. Um, I came up with an idea when answering a rep's question about this. So what I realized is people who don't believe in cash discounting and they don't believe it's the right thing for the consumer – and the right mm -hmm. thing for the business, it's usually because they're asking the wrong question, okay? So right. the question they're asking is this. They're asking, is it right to charge a consumer more when they use their card versus cash? And so from that perspective, I still think the answer is yes, it's fine to do that, but it's more of a complicated dilemma there, right? You know, is it the right thing to do? What if you scare people off, et cetera, et cetera. But that's actually the wrong question or the wrong premise to use. The right question is this. Is it right to charge your cash paying customers more mm -hmm. in order to offset the cost of people who choose to use their card and get reward points and convenience? I, I agree. I've always thought myself that has always been my underlying premise for why I think it's good. Right. As, a, as a cash paying customer, why should I be subsidizing somebody's rewards? Right. 
And so I think, I think what a lot of salespeople maybe don't understand, they have this idea that like, you know, it's interesting talking to credit card processing salespeople because a lot of them just don't have a larger context for business. You know, they understand sales, they understand credit card processing, but they're not looking at the bigger picture. And a lot of them actually feel like the idea of a price increase is somehow like a negative or a bad thing or something merchants dislike. And that's actually not true at all. Mm -hmm. Business owners raise their prices and they're going to raise them again. It's just the cost of doing business. Like right, right. it doesn't matter what your business is. If you have a restaurant, your cost of cheese and meat and everything is going to go up this year. And as mm -hmm. a result, you're going to raise your prices, right? Right. right? So the question, when you're talking to a merchant about it and even kind of convincing yourself as the sales pro professional, you know, think of it in this way. You're all, you know, the merchant is going to raise their price. There is no question about that. That's not a variable. Their price is going to go up. Right. The question is, how is it going to go up? Well, what should happen if the lease on their building goes up? Mm -hmm. How should they, how should they pass that cost on to the consumer? Well, they should raise the price on everything. Right. Because everybody is benefiting from the fact that there's a building there. Right. Right. Same right. with their electric bill, you know? Mm -hmm. Now, what about if we look at their inventory? What if a, what if one of their vendors takes two or three of their popular items and dramatically increases the cost of that item? Well, how, what does the merchant do in that scenario? They raise the price on those items. Mm -hmm. They don't raise the price on everything. You know, it's like, well, three of my items got raised by 30%, so I'm going to raise my prices 1% across the board and lose money on those three items. No, right. no. nobody does that. No. You pass the cost on to the consumer that you have absorbed, right? Right. right? So when we look at credit card processing, and as you've done in insider's reports, the fact that, you know, the cost of interchange, I think what has gone up every year for 10 straight years, right? You know, like that, right? So the cost of payment acceptance is going up. So what is the right, moral, correct way to pass that increase in cost on to the customer? Well, it's when you look at it from that perspective, it's obvious Right. You want to have a non-cash adjustment or you want to have a cash discount or, you know, a surcharge or you want to have some kind of a program where the consumers that are benefiting from this extra cost are the ones that are bearing the, the, the expense. Now, the amount of the non-cash adjustment or the service fee or whatever, that's up for debate, right? But, but ultimately, the right way to do it is to do it that way. And so I think when people, if, if they can understand that concept and the fact that it's actually when you explain that to a business owner, you might be a little confused by that explanation. You might have to back up and play that a couple of times. Right. The business owner won't. They will right. get it immediately. Every business owner I've ever talked to, they understand that logic just instinctively because they, they are running this logic in their head all the time. They're always looking at their costs. Oh, stink. My electric bill went up. Well, we're going to have to next price increase. I got to remember that because I got to incorporate that. Like right. they get it. They understand. Oh, that, you know, I, I, I sell, you know, bicycles and Schwinn took their prices up 30%. I'm going to have to raise my price on all my Schwinn bicycles. They get it. Like they understand that. So it's like, the cost of credit card processing keeps going up. How are you going to pass this on? Obviously, you're going to do it with a non-cash adjustment or a service fee or a surcharge or whatever. And right. that's how you pass it on. It's just a no-brainer. And so that's one of the reasons why businesses instinctively, not all of them, but a good percentage of them like these programs because they instinctively get it because it's a, it's a price increase, just like other price increases that they've done themselves. Right. And, and, and absorbing those price increases is just not good business. No. And so they're, and, so, and they're not going to, right? They're going, right. they're not going to absorb them. They are going to pass them on to their customer. The question is, are they going to pass it on to all of their customers or just the ones who are benefiting from it? Yeah. It's just good to go to your Schwinn example, right? Okay. I go in there and I don't want to pay that much money for a Schwinn. So I'll buy a different, different bike. Exactly. That's the market. Yeah, yeah exactly. So I'm hoping a lot of people will start to kind of internalize this. I know a lot already have, but those who are still kind of questioning. And again, I'm not saying, you know, everybody should sell cash discounting all the time. I'm not saying that at all. Right. I'm just saying there's nothing, you know, we are as an industry, we need to get over this idea that there's something morally wrong with cash discounting or it's it's a bad business decision or it's it's wrong for consumers. It's actually not. It's fine in all of those scenarios, whether or not you choose to sell it, whether or not it ends up being the right solution for a specific vertical or a specific merchant in their situation. Obviously, that's up to the sales professional and the processors to figure out. But right. I just want to clarify that from a logic and kind of a moralistic perspective, cash discounting is fine for the business and it's fine for the consumer as well. It actually does make a lot of sense. It's perfectly kosher, as they would say. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>
James, you know, consumer spending has been picking up in recent months, uh, you know, following those steep declines uh, off the cliff, we might say, that we right. you know, were brought on by the pandemic. Sure. Uh, and as different reports suggest, you know, the, the recovery has been uneven, but it still seems to be a good, a decent recovery. Right. And the other thing and I, that I know we've alluded to before is that consumers are changing the way they prefer to pay. Right. And, and where they want to shop. So um, I thought today, this week, I, um, I would convey some um, interesting met- metrics okay. that paint a picture of what's going on. Right. So following sharp declines in April and May, consumer spending began to rise in June. And uh, by July, had climbed back up above July level, uh, by above all, uh, excuse me, March levels. Right. This according to an analysis that was just published by the Straw Hacker Group and Visa. Now, 48% of consumers report cutting back on spending since the pandemic broke out in March. But 28% say they've actually increased spending. Wow. Which I thought was a very interesting data point. Yeah. Um, and and I, I wondered about this. And I, you know, I wondered about, I was sort of, you know, I always like to, uh, query my friends and relatives when I'm doing this kind of stuff. And, you know, uh, and then I was re- reminded, uh, as many people know, I had an accident this summer. I was laid up. And at one point, my UPS lady said, girl, you got to cut off your internet access because I was buying things, you know, I right, right. couldn't do much else. So, right. you know, I'd buy like three pairs of shoes. Maybe I'll send a few back, but you know, I right. can't go out and look for them. Right. And so I started thinking, you know, that's part of it. Uh, yeah. People are bored and they're right. spending more online. Yep. And, uh, and that, that shows you, uh, in fact, in fact, according to uh, the data from Visa, most of the gains in spending have been for, online restaurant delivery mm. and of course groceries because sure. people are cooking home more right 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 and uh e-commerce payments that's excluding um travel services um that have um gone across the visa network increased about 12 percent have increased about 12 percent since january okay so that gives you that and that's of course just the visa traffic right so the U.S. Department of Commerce puts a little better spin on it It because uh, it takes account of all e-commerce sales. According to Commerce Department, um, e-commerce sales by U.S. merchants rose 30% between January 1st and June 30th, when you wow. compare that to the same mm. period in 2019. Sure. That's huge. That's huge. James. Yeah. It's huge. It's a big, it's such a big shift. You know, it's, we're seeing COVID-19 is having a big impact on consumer behavior. It's mm-hmm. almost like consumer behavior, almost more than consumer spending in a way. Yeah. And I think it's, it, it's, you know, it's the consumer behavior that spills over into right. spending. Right. Exactly. Right? Mm-hmm. And then let's be realistic. I mean, as a shopper, I'm, I'm a lot more inclined to buy something online when I'm shopping in person, I'll say, well, let me come back to this. I'm going to go to another store and see. Right. 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 Whereas if I'm going into a marketplace, like online marketplace, everything's right there. Yeah. Well, and plus there's like, there's, I feel like there's, um, it's interesting because like last night I was working on my email inbox and Christina was sitting next to me on her laptop and she was shopping, you know, mm-hmm. uh, getting some clothes mm-hmm. for the kids and things like that. And it's like, you know, you kind of get this inertia where it's like, well, you already added four or five things to the cart, you know, and she every once in a while, she'd be like, hey, what do you think about this? And I'm like, just buy it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like, uh, I don't, what do you want me to say? I don't know. Yeah, it looks great. I don't know. It's a little picture. I'm not sure. But, you know, like you've already got this cart going, like, keep it going. Let's, you know what I mean? So I don't know. And, I mean, and, and returns are pretty easy if you don't like right, it. Right, right. I think people right? are starting to get more comfortable. They're realizing that they're not going to be totally trapped into the, and, you know, I'll tell you what's interesting. I, I hadn't even thought about this. That shopping that she did last night was with Boss Cause, a local uh, mm-hmm. business here yeah, in the area. Now it's a chain, large right. company, but yeah, it's a local chain. And, right. you know, we know that there's that local store. So it's like we'd, we'd rather not go shopping right now. But if we get a bunch of stuff we don't like, well, we can always, I'm always over there by that Boss Cause. I can always run it in there. So it's kind of, I think people are starting to get right. that comfort level of online and in person and how they can kind of work together, you know? I did the same thing with Kohl's because there's a bunch of Kohl's around here, right? Right, so right. So it's like, 
okay, so I'm going to order this online. And if I don't like it, just the next time I'm in that part of town, I can just slip in there and return. Right, exactly. And the returns are so much easier than they've used to, used to be. Right, right. You know, that 30% increase in e-commerce spending, I think it, it's uh, interesting to put that in perspective also. Um, because Commerce Department data shows that online spending was 18.6% of total retail sales during the first half of the year. Wow. And in 2019, hmm. it was 14%. Yeah. Hmm. So I got to be honest. I'm actually surprised. That I thought it would even be a bigger percentage this year, actually. But it's interesting. Well, I think when we get through the to the end of the year, we're going to see it be a bigger percentage. Right. But okay. Sure. You, you, know, you have to think about just a couple years ago, online sales were maybe 7%. Sure. Well, and plus, retail sales. plus, I guess you have January, February, and part of March where it would have been more kind of business as usual as well. As usual, right? And right. then it started hmm. kicking into gear. Sure. Sure. Now, something else we've talked about here and, and that just, re, re, you know, deserves some reiteration is that um, cash continues to lose favor. Mm -hmm. um, a company called 451 Research reports that uh, over 20% of consumers it recently surveyed said they're using cash less since the pandemic broke out. And Straw Hacker reports that among consumers it surveyed, 26% uh, expect to continue using cash less mm. even once the pandemic is gone. Right. Um, they expect uh, about the same percent expect to be using credit and debit cards more frequently going forward. Hmm. So, so we know that that cash, you know, 26%, 27, 26 percent are using cash less, 27 percent expect to use credit and debit cards more. That's pretty much hmm. where that money is going. Right. Um, and a majority of consumers, 60 percent, believe that contactless cards are safer in terms of presenting, you know, preventing the spread of COVID. Sure. Yeah, and that's something we've talked about a lot here. Right. May or may not uh, be the case, but it's it's consumer perception anyway. So it's exactly it. And, uh, you know, uh, just over one in six consumers have made their first contactless payment hmm. this year. Wow, that's cool. Hmm. That's really cool. And 86 percent of those people say they expect to continue doing it. Yeah. Um, a straw hacker also found that 55 percent of consumers currently using them i mean okay so the uh 86 of the ones that were the first time users right that want to keep on doing it was a company called was from research done by 451 hmm. uh straw hacker found a little bit less but it was still i think very interesting and again straw hackers deck data was based on uh visa network volume right uh, as well as a consumer survey but they 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 speculated that 55 percent of consumers who are using contactless cards now will continue using them going forward and will use them more frequently. Hmm. Yeah. Well, and that just tells you, you know, I mean, again, we've talked about it so much. I think our industry right now is so hot on cash discounting and surcharging as it should be. But a lot of times that can almost overshadow the contactless. I mean, in right. my, in my opinion, if cash discounting and surcharging had not become a big thing, right now everybody would be talking about contactless all the time. That would be the sales approach. Exactly. Right. Because a lot of small businesses are just simply not set up for contactless the way that they should be. Or if they are, they don't understand it at all. Um, and I think that's uh, honestly, I think in, in in some ways it's almost as big of an opportunity right now as cash discounting because it's a, a shorter window and it's more urgency, you know? Yeah. You know, I'll, I'll give you a, I'll give you an anecdote. Um, I was visiting a massage therapist not long ago mm -hmm. and she had uh, square. She had a little contactless thing and it was really cool. And I said, so, you know, have you, you know, I was very happy I could use the contactless. Right. And, but I said to her, so how happy are you with square? And she's like, well, I was until they raised the rates. Right. I right. said, so have you heard about cash discounting? <laughs> she's like, no, well, let me explain this to you. Right. So I'm telling people out there, a lot of those small merchants that are right. doing square right now. Yeah. This is an opportunity. I, oh, 100%. I, even, I even told her, I said, you know, I'll ask around. I'll find an agent for you. You can sell right. some cash discount. Right. I'm, I imagine you could find one. <laughs> I'm sure I can. But, you know, I think that those kind of like my, what we call micro merchants. Right. It's a great opportunity. So, you know, give them an, a solution that supports contactless and give them cash discounting. Right. And you'll have clients for life. Yeah. 
Love it. This episode of the Merchant Sales Podcast was brought to you by Valor Paytech, the technology company that is revolutionizing cash discounting and surcharging with innovative features like dual mid support, waive the fee options, and even adding non-cash adjustment charges to tips. Now, all of this is made possible by a variety of technology devices and solutions such as gateways, tabletop point of sale devices, and features like SMS text messaging and e-invoicing, all with cash discounting in mind. Valor Pay Tech, bold ideas, smart execution. Make sure you head over to ccsalespro.com slash valor, V-A-L-O-R, ccsalespro.com slash valor. Valor, V-A-L-O-R. Schedule your free demo today and watch videos and learn more about this amazing technology solution. Thank you for listening to the Merchant Sales Podcast. Whether you are an industry veteran, processing executive, or just trying to learn about the payment space, we appreciate your time. The Merchant Sales Podcast is a joint production of greensheet.com and ccsalespro.com. And we hope you will tune in next week for more information and tips on building your merchant services business.